We exist first. We're thrown into the world. And then it's up to us to create our essence. And authenticity through this lens is you know, a process of creating your essence in ways that you choose. Hello and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today we welcome philosopher Sky Cleary to the show. Sky is a lecturer at Columbia University and the City College of New York. She's the author of Existentialism and Romantic Love and co-editor of How to Live a Good Life. Her writing has appeared in the Paris Review, Business Insider, TED Ed, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, among other outlets. In 2021, she was a McDowell Fellow, and in 2017, she won the New Philosopher Writers Award. Her latest book, which is the topic of our chat today, is called How to Be Authentic. In this episode, I talked to Cleary about Simone de Beauvoir's life and how it has informed her existentialist philosophy. As a feminist during the 40s, Simone was passionate about freedom of choice. It's not a surprise then that her definition of authenticity also revolves around self-determination. Authenticity is not about finding a true self, but rather a process of creating who we want to be. Sky and I also touch on the topics of gender, power, social justice, narcissism, and fulfillment. This is a really rich conversation with a dear friend of mine. I just think the world of Sky and I actually think she's the modern day Simone de Beauvoir. So without further ado, I bring you Sky Query. Sky Query, wow, so good to see you. <laughs> so good to see you too, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's been ages. <laughs> it has. Not a proper catch up. Can you see the bar in the background here? Yes, it's great. <laughs> Okay, good. No, um, yeah, well, the existentialists loved their cocktails and alcohol. Um, but, you know, just in moderation, of course. What is it about the uh, French existentialist philosophers that grabs you so much? Uh, what do you think it is within you that uh, resonates? I mean, a lot of things. And I think one of the big things was their emphasis on freedom and responsibility. And I came across the existential philosophers back in, you know, long time ago in my 20s, when I had a lot of questions about life and love, and was introduced through some MBA classes to uh, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre and some of the other Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. And I also read a book called Tete a Tete by Hazel Rowley, which was all about the relationship with between Beauvoir and Sartre. And I really admired how they pushed back on what was expected of them and kind of created a relationship on their own terms, um, but while still acknowledging, you know, other people around them to, to varying extents. But I, what attracted me most about Simone de Beauvoir was that she was so brave in, you know, think about it, in the 1940s, she was in this open relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre and they were becoming famous. I mean, that was scandalous. That I mean, it still is kind of scandalous to be in an open relationship, but especially back then, you know, 80 years ago. And Simone de Beauvoir, she she was just such a you know a brilliant character. You know, she was super intelligent. Um, she studied at the Sorbonne. She was one of the few women to to study there, and the youngest person ever to to graduate from from these from the, her philosophy studies. And she wrote The Second Sex in 1949, which was groundbreaking, really, and really sparked a, a second wave of feminism. And so it was. This, this um, language, I guess, or framework that they were using to think about the tension between self-determination and responsibility and ethics and getting along in the world with other people. Uh, yeah, we'll get to all of that. <laughs> we'll get to all of that. I want to double click on the second sex for, for a second before we get to uh, her other philosophy. I wonder if she would even like the current incarnation of feminism and say that it's taking feminists a step back. I don't know. Um, but I do know, you know, there's a, a quote she has, a very famous quote from that book, one is not born, but rather becomes woman. In one sense, that seems very aligned with transgenderism. I'm wondering what your thoughts are where she would be today. I mean, that's a really hard question to answer. And, you know, Beauvoir has been drawn upon to, I guess, defend both sides of the argument. On the one hand, she says, as you say, one isn't born, but becomes a woman, suggesting that, you know, we're, we're socialized into becoming feminine or masculine. And there is, uh, you know, there sound, seems to be possibilities for gender freedom in what she was doing. And she, she was against all forms of oppression. 
So what I think she would have been looking at is, okay, well, where are people oppressed? Uh, where are people oppressed? And certainly there are lots of hard-won freedoms um, of that the feminism movement has has done. On the other hand, she said, you know, a, a couple of things that um, can be used against in the transgender debate, such as, um, you know, that a woman is talking about the way a woman is defined. And, you know, if being born a woman has certain implications for the history that that you I guess collect along the way and the way that you're treated and the way that that you grow up and so that kind of history of of being a woman that matters um so I I'm erring towards the um opinion that she if I had to hypothesize which is really hard that she would have been definitely supportive of people expressing themselves in ways that they choose and society being supportive of, of those different gender expressions. Yeah, you could see a really nuanced essay that she would write on the topic, though, because it's th there's a lot of one hands and the other hands there. You know, there is definitely she you, you could you could almost reconstruct an essay she'd write because you know her so well at this point in fact i call you a modern day <laughs> simone de beauvoir so uh so uh you know, on the you know on the one hand um absolutely and i love uh, the idea of uh, rebellion is a great concept the idea of um we should fight against um oppression in any form um, is a real message of hers. But I also think that the other hand is this idea of existence preceding essence does assume that there does begin some sort of existence. And I, I almost get the sense that she's saying biological women become women through socialization, but she's not saying any human becomes a woman. Like, do turtles become women? <laughs> Actually, this is one of the big questions that she, that inspired her to write The Second Sex, which was really, you know, what what is a woman? What does it mean to be a woman? Yeah, and a thousand she, pages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And she says, like, in the introduction, you know, what, what makes a woman? Is it her ovaries? Is it having a uterus? Is it wearing a skirt? And she's like, well, no, because there are lots of women who, uh, uh, you know, don't wear skirts or don't necessarily have ovaries. And um, so she's, and she's also saying that not only that, but often people with ovaries and a uterus are criticized for not being a woman or not being feminine enough. And so there's this um, socialization, as, as you say, that occurs. And, you know, Beauvoir saw this as sort of these opinions that people are imposing on, on people with certain organs as limiting our freedom and those, you know, our sex organs shouldn't define how, how we behave or what kind of career we have. Like she was saying that being a woman with, with a uterus doesn't mean that you are, are, you know, destined to become a mother. She's like, no, let's embrace our transcendence and our freedom. We should be able to make those choices about, about who we become and how we create our lives. Yeah, I thought that was so interesting when you wrote about that, how how long it took her to answer that question, especially in light of Matt Walsh's documentary, What is a Woman? I just had a cheeky thought of like, I wonder if she was in that documentary, how she would answer that question. She would say, read my 1,000-page damn book because it's a lot more complicated than you're making it, Matt Walsh. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I mean, it's it's interesting to think about her, her opinions in today's world, um, which is what I tried to do with my book. But, of course, there are limitations on that. You know, we, we don't know exactly what, what she would have said. And, you know, think about back then in the 1940s, you know, trans identities were, like, there were trans people around and she actually talks really sympathetically about an intersex person who was, I guess, one of her neighbors or lived in the, the same hotel as she did for, for a time. And she was, she didn't write extensively about it, but in the part she does write in her memoirs and in her novel, uh, She Came to Stay, she writes about it in a really sympathetic way, saying like, okay, so acknowledging like that the torment that and the discrimination that that um, people can face when they don't fit into the the sex binary. Well, that's just it then. I think if anything, uh, at its base, we can assume that whatever she would write on the modern day issues would come from a place of justice and compassion. So that's probably the the, the one thing we can assume. Yeah, I would, I would, with, I would hope so. I would think that, you know, Beauvoir certainly made, made mistakes in her time. But yeah, I think she, she really tried to, to, um, take, you know, be, be compassionate. Yeah.
Yeah. Oh boy, the idea of authenticity is something we bo- we both uh, are absolutely kind of almost obsessed with understanding. Like, what is authenticity? And I've argued there really is no such thing as a real self um, from a psychological perspective. And it looks like Simone really would agree with that. You know that there is no true self. You you, you see that a lot in the in the literature right? or in the self help world as well. Like, just all you got to do to be authentic is tap into your true self. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I got so many selves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, and so yes, I've read your excellent article on on authenticity in Scientific American, and you know, I was also struck by there are you know a lot of overlaps, um, and you know, for for Beauvoir, yeah, it's and it comes back to what you said before about existence preceding essence. So we exist first; we're thrown into the world. And then it's up to us to create our essence. And authenticity through this lens is you know, a process of creating your essence in ways that you choose. It's about embracing your freedom to, to shape your, your life. And this is one of the questions that really got me into uh, researching authenticity was all this talk about, oh, yeah, just be yourself. Just be your true self. And I'm like... Yeah, well, what is that? How do I even find my true self? Like, what, where, where is it? You know, how do I look for it? How do I know when I find it? And what if I don't like it? You know, so all these <laughs> different questions. And what I appreciated about Beauvoir's understanding was that, you know, she acknowledges where we're fragmentary beings, that we're always growing and becoming more than we are. And certainly we, we are a, a synthesis of our past, you know, where, where the past, some of our past actions, um, we're also our present selves who are choosing, but we're also our goals and intentions. So for, for Beauvoir, yeah, it's important to introspect and, and reflect on the choices we're making or the choices we have made. But what's super important in, with authenticity is, how we orient ourselves in into the future and how we set goals and pursue them. You mean transcendence? Transcending, yes. <laughs> yes. And you know, the, when I was reading your book, I was just and, and by the way, I got the the privilege of reading your book very early in the process. So this is I, I I've had to keep it to my chest. I can't. I, I wanted to just tell everyone all about your book and how awesome it was, but that was oh, way I'm before so it was released. Yeah, Scott. Yes, and but I was I was struck by a lot of things reading your book. Uh, one, I already kind of mentioned uh, that I was struck by um, the congruence between her thinking about authenticity and um, sort of psychologists um, and the way they are thinking about authenticity these days, um, especially humanistic psychologists. Um, but that's no coincidence because humanistic psychologists really were ins- deeply inspired by the French existentialists, including uh, well, especially Rollo May. Um, he tried to take uh, existentialism and put it firmly into the field of psychology. So, um, so that's no coincidence. Um, but I was also deeply struck by this notion of transcendence and this notion of uh, authenticity uh, being and getting outside of yourself in some ways. Uh, to me, that's I love that. I couldn't love that more. Um, that notion of authenticity. So that that really struck me as well. And uh, and I think that it's not uh, the uh, lay person's thinking of what authenticity is. When they think authenticity, they think well, just doing whatever impulses they feel or saying whatever they want. And uh, and that's not quite right, right? Right. Well, Beauvoir would say, fine, that's, that's existing if we're just responding right. to our animal nature and our impulses. That, that's part of the facts of our existence. But we're not only the facts of our existence, we're also freedom, which, and we exercise our freedom by transcending and by overcoming ourselves. And her vision was that you know she wanted everyone to be what she called a pure transparent freedom and meaning that she she envisioned a, a utopian world where everybody would be able to surpass the given surpass the facts of their existence into an open future of their choosing and so Part of authenticity, um, of becoming authentic is like taking on this, this process because authenticity isn't like a, a static thing that you, you can achieve and then you're done. Authenticity, uh, is in the intention. It's, it's the action. It's, it's the behavior. It's orienting yourself in, in authentic ways. Um, 
But also she acknowledged that, yeah, sure, there are facts of our existence that, that we can't overcome. We, we can't choose that we were born. We can't choose our parents. Um, but what's important from an existential perspective is that we figure out, like, where that window of freedom is and stretch ourselves towards it and think about how we, how we can choose our freedom and, and choose who we become. Wow. The trauma, loss, and uncertainty of our world have led many of us to ask life's biggest questions, such as who are we? What is our highest purpose? And how do we not only live through, but thrive in the wake of tragedy, division, and challenges to our fundamental way of living? To help us all address these questions, process what this unique time in human history has meant for us personally and collectively, and emerge whole, I've collaborated with my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jordan Feingold, MD, to bring you our forthcoming book. It's called Choose Growth a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. It's a workbook designed to guide you on a journey of committing to growth and the pursuit of self-actualization every day. It's chock full of research from humanistic psychology, positive psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, cognitive science, and neuropsychology. So lots of themes that you hear about on this podcast. And it's aimed to help us all integrate the many facets of ourselves and co-create our new normal with a renewed sense of strength, vitality, and hope. Whether you're healing from loss, adapting to the new normal, or simply looking ahead to life's next chapter, Choose Growth will help steer you there to deeper connection to your values, your life vision, and ultimately your most authentic self. Choose Growth will officially hit the shelves September 13th, and you can pre-order your copy or the audiobook in the U.S. now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and all major retailers. If you're in the U.K. and Commonwealth, you can pre-order now at bookshop.org.uk. We truly hope this book helps you grow and thrive and become your best self. Okay, now back to the show. So it's almost like authenticity is living up to our ideals of who we want to be. Well, that's one way to put it. And I I think ideal, uh, okay, so that's kind of a fraught term. You know, there is a problem with with setting up an ideal of ourselves and subordinating subordinating ourselves to it and and treating it like this ideal self as a god that we have to obey. So, but what she was saying is that we need to let's let's set up goals of our choosing and strive towards them while acknowledging our our evolving nature and acknowledging um, that failure is a fact of life and that that there are no mistakes that that we can't move beyond and and keep transcending toward towards those goals it doesn't even have to be an ideal self yeah i just meant our values our, our ideals yeah yeah uh okay. that's how i kind of conceptualize values uh mm-hmm. but uh in, in a way, but yeah, no, that's how. That, thanks, you, thank you so much for that clarification. So the idea of the vital thing there being creating ourselves. Um, well, obviously, I love that as a creativity researcher, uh, and this idea of um, creative rebellion. I mean, what a great phrase! Is are there that many phrases in life that are better than that one? <laughs> yeah, I like it too. I like it too. Creative um, rebellion. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, rebellion was really implicit in in Beauvoir's um, idea of authenticity because, I mean, ideally it wouldn't be. Ideally, we would be all pure, transparent freedoms and able to stretch ourselves, you know, in ways that we choose in the world and, and other people would be obstacles, but, you know, they wouldn't be oppressors. And because, of course, as we kind of go about our, our activities, we're always bumping up against other people who are, who are trying to do their thing too. But, you know, as Beauvoir says, as long as oppression exists, we, we're going to need to rebel against it. We're going to need to push back because, you know, we can't truly be authentic until everyone can be authentic. We can't truly be free and, until everybody's free because we coexist with others. And if we, we're trying to be free and authentic and, you know, amidst exploitation and oppression, then that's that's a problem because our, our authenticity comes at the expense of other people's authenticity. And this is why she's also quite different to a lot of the other existentialists because she focused on this dimension uh, of ethics and really tried to find out. I mean, you've probably heard of um, Dostoevsky saying, if God is dead, then anything is permitted. 
I mean, she really tried to push back against against yeah. that and saying, "Well, no, it not it, that it doesn't mean that." This is how she founded her ethics in our relationships with other people. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, you know, a lot of people associate the right with the idea of taking responsibility, you know, and um, a big part of her message is, you know, we act by taking responsibility for who we become. And she also deeply, deeply cares about what a lot of the left cares about, which is vulnerable populations and oppression. Um, so I love like not thinking about life in either or terms. And I really love the idea that we can really extol the merits of taking responsibility for existence while also really caring for those who are legitimately oppressed, you know, in our society through lots of uh, system-wide things that we have set up. And so I just love that nuance. It's not one or the or the other. And I just feel like in our political discourse these days, it's like just, oh, everyone takes a polarized side. Either you, you're like, oh, I care about responsibility, or you're like, everyone's helpless and we just need to take care of them. And um, I don't know. I just think there's a middle ground here. And it was it's so it's so refreshing to kind of see that middle ground in her philosophy. Does that make sense at all? I agree. I, I found it <laughs> refreshing too. <laughs> Initially, when Beauvoir started writing The Second Sex, she, she kind of said she wasn't really concerned about oppression so much. She wasn't concerned about political issues so much. But then you know, we had World War Two, And then and she also uh, started thinking about about her privilege. And when she started writing The Second Sex and, and thinking about women's situation, and realized that, you know, she wasn't wealthy, her family wasn't wealthy, she had to go and get a job, um, she because she didn't have a dowry. And so but she realized, I mean, she was smart, and she was able to get a great education. And, and she recognized that that privilege, um, and and used her her privilege and her fame in order to support other women and to fight against oppression. And she was one of the um, key instigators of it was called the manifesto of the 343, um, which was a petition signed by 343 women who had claimed to um, have an abortion. And that was sort of part of the process of, of legalizing abortion in, and allowing greater access to contraception in, in the 1970s in France. Wonderful. Um, what would you say was uh, one of her biggest weaknesses if you had you know to say because no one's perfect right so if you gave her a full balanced review what would you say is one thing that maybe she even struggled with in her life yeah well i mean she struggled with a lot of things you know one of the things that frustrates me was okay so she was in this relationship with jean paul sartre it was a lifelong relationship and she prioritized that relationship above all others mm. and that's had a lot of ramifications for for other people and other people were were very because they had an open relationship right so and other people you know were, were very hurt and she had this agreement with Sartre to that they would be primary lovers and would allow themselves contingent lovers um, and so that was all fine and well for them but it was extremely hurtful for these contingent lovers and one of them committed suicide and you know so you know it had really serious implications and and I mean to her credit she did recognize this later in her life and sort of said you know I think it's our fault and said that she may have been a little overly obsessed with freedom especially when it came to to other people um, so I, I mean, that's my, my greatest heartache, I think, when it, when it comes to her, because it seems also in contradiction with, with her philosophy, which is about being loving and, and compassionate and respectful of other people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, I appreciate you, you pointing that out. You know, there's a lot of tensions of, of being human in a lot of ways. You're you're saying she had human conflicts. Um, and uh, this is an interesting sort of tension. The tension between how we create ourselves, how other people influence how we create ourselves, how we influence other people creating themselves, and how we might collectively recreate the world to orient ourselves towards authenticity. I mean, that's, that's not easy being human. Can we, can we admit that? Yeah, it's, it's not at all easy. And becoming authentic, it's, it's challenging. Um, but it's also incredibly rewarding and, and exhilarating. It's part of being human. And she said, and she's not saying that happiness will, you know, 
definitely come from authenticity, but orienting herself in in authentic ways. You know, happiness tends to be a side effect of that. And the other thing is that, you know, not not transcending, not stretching ourselves in in authentic ways is kind of like a a metaphysical malnutrition Um, because, you know, otherwise going back to existence precedes essence. So if we're not creating our essence, then, then we're just existing and our, our essence becomes someone else's creation. Um, and so what's important for, for Bawa is to really try and become agents of our own lives. And that can be incredibly rewarding. Yeah. It, it's rewarding. Let's double click on why that's rewarding. Um, uh, why is it potentially feel more rewarding than just um, enacting all your impulses non-reflectively um, and just being kind of the whims of your desires as opposed to intentionally creating yourself? Um, wh- why is that more rewarding? Yeah, this is a good question. She definitely thinks that, you know, if, if I mean, your life is yours and it's up to you. And I think I can give an example of, um, she wrote a story in, when things of the spirit come first. Well, there's a, there are a collection of short stories and a male character in there, his name's Dennis. And yeah, he is just at the whim of his impulses. He's just going with the flow. He believes that nothing really matters and that um, he, he makes promises, but they, they mean nothing to him. And he's a very nihilistic character. And I mean, he's not happy. He's not finding... Um, life to be rewarding. He's just just at the whim of serendipity, or not even serendipity, just at the whim of of whatever comes his way. And so so he's not happy. And he also creates a lot of chaos around him, and and creates a lot of lot of heartache. You know, he's he um, is awful to his wife, and runs off with his wife's sister, and hurt, breaks her heart. And authenticity, from Beauvoir's perspective, is about acknowledging. Our situation and acknowledging that we do have freedom or not only that we have freedom that that we are freedom and you know not free to do anything as I said before and acknowledging that we we have a responsibility because freedom without responsibility is is meaningless it just devolves into hedonism or, or nihilism or it's something else but existential philosophy is very much about accepting responsibility for our actions and for the, the world we're creating around us and acknowledging our, our coexistence with other people. You mentioned in your book how um, a lot of people confuse power and freedom. And I'd, I'd love for you to unpack that a little more because that really, when I got to that sentence in your book, I was like, oh, I really, I want Sky to unpack that more. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, when we talk about freedom from an existential sense and actually, you know, from a psychological sense too, you know, Eric Fromm talked about this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, um, <My> boy. <laughs> you know, freedom get, gets thrown around a lot. But, you know, when we're talking about freedom, there's there's at least two dimensions of, of the term. Uh, there's freedom from, which is what we mean by uh, liberty, you know, freedom from oppression. But there's also the dimension of freedom too, which is about power. It's about our actions. You know, what are we free to do? Um, so, you know, power is a certain kind of um, aspect of freedom. So we might be free from oppression, but if unless we're, you know, free to act on our um, on our choices, then that sort of freedom becomes meaningless. So, you know, we might be free to fly, but unless we have, you know, the power to fly, unless we have wings or unless we can get on an airplane, then then that freedom doesn't make sense. And this is particularly relevant. Um, and I think it's actually also a um, Digget's Jean-Paul Sartre, who is her lifelong partner, um, that, you know, he... He says things like, oh, we're never so free as, as when we're in chains. And Beauvoir's point was like, okay, fine, you, fine, you, you're free to think as you choose. And sure, that's important. But what's even more important is to be free to transcend those chains and to be free to, um, make, make choices about your life, which you can't do if you're in chains. So she sort of takes it, takes it one step further. And, and that's also where the rebellion element of her philosophy comes in. It must have had so many interesting, 
debates and discussions and disagreements. They, you know, they, they didn't have exactly the same philosophy about the good life. So that, that must have been interesting. Right. And that was what Beauvoir, I, I think she said she loved most about Sartre was that, you know, he, they talked about all their ideas together. And she, I mean, she says, you know, he was as smart as I was, although I kind of think she was probably smarter, but, you know, <laughs> beside the point. <laughs> <laughs> But the point is that, yeah, they were, they really inspired each other. They were catalytic muses for one another and they, they read all one another's work and, and gave feedback on it. And it was really that sort of intellectual friendship that, that, you know, Beauvoir loved so much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was such an interesting relationship. And I'm so glad you wrote your book, the book you did, because I think uh, Jean Paul gets more, uh, written about him than than Simone has written about her and you know in terms of biographies and stuff you know she um you used to say you know I'm not the philosopher you know Jean-Paul Sartre is the philosopher I'm I'm just a novelist I, I write essays and um which is you know one of the big mysteries about Beauvoir and you know, one of, one of the theories is that, well, she, I mean, think about it back in the 1930s and 40s, the Sorbonne philosophy department, you know, there were, you know, people who were, you know, kind of career philosophers and, you know, she didn't see herself as kind of part of that system of you know, wanting to, you know, philosophize academically or, you know, she didn't care about writing journal articles. She cared about philosophy and its application to everyday life. And even in, she was even thinking about this way before she met Jean Paul Sartre, you know, in her student diary, she said, my philosophy must be from life. So she was thinking about, you know, she'd already studied, you know, Hegel and Kant and people like that. And she was like, you know, I don't want to do abstract armchair philosophizing like them. I want to know, you know, how philosophy can, can help me live my life in, in richer ways. Yes, yes. Tell our audience a little bit more about you, Sky. I should have done that and I should have started out, out the whole episode with this because your whole body of work in philosophy is broader um, than, than uh, just focusing on Simone, uh, right? I mean, you've, you've done books like How to Live a Good Life, you know, you've, you've done a lot on female leadership, you know, and uh, yeah, like, so tell people about how awesome you are. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, so, well, yes, you're right. I co-edited um, How to Live a Good Life with some friends, and that was a collection of essays, like looking at different different philosophies of life. My first book was called Existentialism and Romantic Love, which uh, came out of my, my PhD. And, yeah, I, I teach at uh, Columbia University, and I have had taught, I did teach it at Barnard College, um, but I finished up there now. And I teach at, at the City College of New York as well. Um, and I, one of my favorite subjects up there is uh, the philosophy of love and sex. Yeah, that's such a such a fascinating topic. Maybe we can get you back on the podcast someday just to discuss that one. Sure. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Happy to do that. So fascinating. <laughs> Returning to this notion of authenticity and the idea that the kind of authenticity that Simone was talking about is is intertwined with intersubjectivity. Can you unpack a little bit what that what that word means in this context, intersubjectivity? So intersubjectivity is the foundation of ethical relations but between people. And really what it means is mutual respect for one another's freedom and facticity. And it's acknowledging that I'm a subject, you're an object, but also you're you're a subject to you, and I'm an object to 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 you. And but really, what it means is acknowledging that other people's lives are as rich and deep as our own. That pain and suffering is is as real as as my own as well. And this is where she gets to to friendship, and she's like, why why is our world based on you know domination and you know power, and why why aren't human relationships based on freedom and intersubjectivity was was the key to that if we can acknowledge other people's situations um, that other people have their own goals and desires and that can be um, a relationship even if we don't call people friends but that sort of friendly relationship is is the path forward to to uh, a better world 
Oh, wow. I, oh, I wish I wish she was here today to, to, to weigh in on some of this. But we have you. We have you <laughs> in, the, in this generation. The idea of authenticity, it raises the question, what is inauthenticity? I was wondering your thoughts on whether you think social media is making us inauthentic by the, by the kind of definition that Simone had, because it certainly seems so to me. <laughs> I think so too. Um, and just to put it in context, I mean, back in Beauvoir's time, you know, there was no social media, but, um, there were, you know, she started up a, a journal and so there were plenty of magazines, you know, and Beauvoir talked about narcissism as, you know, a manifestation of, of bad faith. And often we think about narcissism as someone's, um, feeling worthless and they're seeking validation. Um, but Beauvoir saw narcissism as a, an existential response, as an escape from facing up to our lives and facing up to the reality of our lives and an escape from creating our own values and, and seeking worth, um, for ourselves. And, you know, she, talks about um, how narcissism is, you know, kind of, I, I mentioned this before, you know, setting up an ideal image of yourself and pretending that, you know, think about, you know, Instagram profiles or whatever, you know, the, setting up these these cohesive kind of static images of ourselves and making that kind of image, like that mask, you know, a central meaning in our life. And, I mean, the problem with that is that it's not only misrepresenting ourselves to, to other people, um, but it's also it risking alienation. When we become so obsessed with um, our worth being defined by other people and forget that we're, you know, we're complex, fragmented beings. And so for Beauvoir, this kind of narcissism is a crisis of character and it sucks meaning out of our lives and now, although there wasn't social media in Beauvoir's time she often saw it in um, she had a lot of friends who were actors and actresses who were kind of seeking this this validation on the stage um, and she was very um, critical of that and she saw it, it was very superficial not not all actors are, are narcissistic but what she saw is that when people aren't creating themselves through their art form and, and treating their their vocation as, of acting as as a, as a true art form and rather they're just doing it for the fame that's that's when it becomes really problematic and so well how do you overcome that you know Beauvoir was suggesting that you know try and release ourselves from being so dependent on other people for our worth and value um, and certainly we, we need other people in our lives. You know, other people are important in that they reflect aspects of our being back to us and, and we can learn about, about ourselves in and through other people. Um, but she sort of thought, let, let's try and release ourselves from creating this static image of ourselves and, and hold ourselves in question. Yes, yes. Um, the a thought entered my head that I was like, oh, that would make a good tweet. And that's that, yes, it's true, not all actors are narcissists, but all narcissists are actors. Okay. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? <laughs> From an existential philosophy perspective. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe actors in the broader sense of the term. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's part of what narcissism is, you know, putting on yeah. this mask for, yeah. for other people, hiding ourselves, misrepresenting ourselves. Yeah. They're, they're highly misrepresenting themselves. Yes, yeah, so I love I love all this. Um, and, and I really I really resonate with this philosophy. This idea of the role of, of genes, though, um, and what we know about behavioral genetics, modern behavioral genetics, I wonder what she would say about creating yourself because we can't complete we can't create ourselves out of whole cloth i guess is what i would say and i don't think i don't think she would say that either right like certainly no. bio biological constraints yeah absolutely i mean that our genes would be what beauvoir calls um part of our facticity the the facts of our lives we but what it. she was most concerned with was okay we're not only the facts of our lives we're, we're a lot right. more than that and so she's like right. where's that where's that window of freedom and even neuroscientists are finding that we do seem to have some you know we are able to say 
control our impulses and, you know, there are uh, windows of freedom that, that we can work with. So, yeah, what, there's been a lot of development in, in neuroscience, but I think what we're finding is, okay, more about what constitutes the facts of our lives. And, and that's really important. So we can be more lucid about what we, what sort of freedom we do have and, and where we can choose. And you, you talk about how all of that is relevant to the various stages of life and different kinds of relationships. Um, you cover the, our formative years, our friendships, our romantic love, our mar- marriage, motherhood, not fatherhood, <laughs> motherhood, um, aging, and death. Yeah, why, why do you focus only on motherhood there, by the way? Well, I, I do focus a little bit on on parenthood and and the role of fathers, and I think I okay partly because okay Beauvoir herself foc- was focusing on women's situation and in the second sex, you know, she talks about about the mother, and also because I'm a mother myself, and that's that's an experience I can speak to, and you know, I do talk a little bit about about my partner who is a, a father and you know a little bit about his experience and you know that's that's a good criticism of of Beauvoir that she she did focus on women but you know I'm not sure how far that criticism can go because you know she was a woman and she was speaking from from her experience and looking at other people's experience and you know you can't write about everything kind of like the all lives matter argument yeah and because this book is a combination of philosophy and also Beauvoir's biography and my my own experience the emphasis is is on on motherhood um but also you know i have tried to acknowledge you know the the fatherhood perspective or you know there's um a philosopher her name's uh, i think it's naomi stadlin who says that you know anyone who takes care of a child um is really you know taking on the role of a mother um mm-hmm. so i don't know but- if i agree with that or you agree with that but uh yeah I'm um, focusing on caregiving yeah, that's so interesting. You cover all these different stages of fulfillment, and I, I, I'm trying to understand as well how you conceptualize fulfillment, because I want to see how that could be similar different than how psychologists think about fulfillment. You know, for, for the existential philosophers, including Beauvoir, you know, it's not as if fulfillment is a point that can be achieved. It's like it's a receding goal. Or maybe fulfillment only comes at the moment of death, when there is no more becoming, mm-hmm. when that's, you know, our life, at least on this earth, is finished, it's it's fulfilled. Um, but authenticity is a process of orienting ourselves toward that, that, I mean, I'm using fulfillment in kind of the broader sense of the term, not in terms of the notion that we're like this empty vessel and we need to fulfill it with, oh, uh, you know, a partner, uh, maybe a kid, maybe some friends and, you know, some, you know, a, a, a house. And, you know, so it's not like we're, we're these empty vessels that, that can be filled and suddenly we'll be, we'll be happy. Rather, it's a, an orientation t- towards death and in fact i'm getting towards heidegger's notion that we're being towards death but beauvoir mm-hmm. said no sure death forms this kind of uh, natural limitation of our lives but the authentic mm-hmm. project is being towards life so yeah it's thinking about how can how can we live how can we live fully and and, and you know embrace all of life all that life has to offer us yes i imagine writing this book for you was an important step for on your quest for fulfillment uh yeah well i i think so yes it had a lot of i i mean i had a lot of questions and you know i still i still have questions but i think that it helped me to understand the the notion of of authenticity better and it gave me a a framework and and a language to to reflect on on the choices i'm making and and how i'm creating myself so yeah yeah i hope you feel good about it i hope you feel proud um, yes. Not easy, not easy writing a book, but it's a really important book. I hope people uh, listening to this episode are inspired to go out and buy it. It's called How to Be Authentic. Simone <laughs> Beauvoir and the Quest for Fulfillment, Existentialism, and Romantic Love. I'm honored you came on the Psychology Podcast, and I wish you all the best with the rest of your book tour. Oh, thank you so much, Scott. Thanks for having me. It was lovely to chat with you. Likewise. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. 
If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thusecologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.